Can we give Jesus praise? He's the one who deserves it. Oh, come on, let's do better than that. Can we give our Lord and Savior the praise that is becoming the King of kings and the Lord of lords? What a mighty God. What a man of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yes, yeah, so I, um, I thought that we just grabbed coffee yesterday because you just wanted coffee. I did not know that there was a fasting thing going on. And then he called me and said, um, so uh, you got any plans? What do you feel like you want to eat uh, today? And I said, well, let's just do it after church. He said, that sounds really great. So right after church, we can go eat. So now I thought you were just wanting to hang with me. But there was another... <laughs> There was another reason behind it. Well, it's so good to see all of you all and so excited about the series that you all are in, uh, really realizing how important it is to follow the way and being anchored uh, in the things that really will sustain us through the difficulties of life. And for those of you who don't know it, uh, the joy of following spiritual disciplines is that they allow you to get tools to be able to navigate uh, through the ways of life, like this winding road that we would never be able to figure out if it were not for the things that give us direction. And so I pray today that the Word of God will even uh, maybe give us a little bit more of an understanding of how that plays a part uh, in navigating the way. So let's pray together as we go before the Lord. Father, thank you so much for the worship that's been lifted to your name. Thank you for the time of fellowship and communion around, uh, around your supper, reminded of your uh, death, burial, and resurrection. But thank you that we did it in community. We didn't do it by ourselves. We were able to do it together. Thank you so much for this church, for the calling, for the purpose and the mission of it. Thank you for the work that they're doing, not just here, but even around the world. We pray, God, in these next few moments that you would draw us closer to you. At the end of it, God, that you would get the glory and the honor and the praise, that it would not go to any person or to any place, but to you. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen and amen. So the first service, I said that whenever the Lord instructs or leads me to sing a song, it must be Jesus, um, because I'm not really a singer. And so as I sing this song that the Lord has instructed me to sing, if I hit a wrong note, uh, please uh, don't make it obvious on your face uh, that I'm, <laughs> that I'm so, you know. So you, 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 do you know that song? Okay, all right. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a song. It just really talks about being anchored in the Word of God. So, so here it is. Hallelujah. Though the storms keep on raging in my life, and sometimes it's hard to tell the night from day, still that hope that lies within, it's reassured. As I keep my eyes upon the distant shore, I know he'll lead me safely to that blessed place he has prepared. But if the storms don't cease, and if the winds keep blowing in my life, my soul has been anchored in the Lord. Oh. sometimes in this life you're gonna be tossed by the waves and the currents that seem so fierce hallelujah but I like this but in the word of God I've got an anchor yes I do and it keeps me steadfast and unmovable despite the tides but if the storms don't cease and just in case the winds keep on blowing in my life my
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anybody's soul anchored in Jesus? Come on, don't play with me. Is there anybody's soul anchored in the Word of the living God? Then give Him a praise that His Word is forever settled. That His Word is forever settled in the heavens and the earth. That His Word is forever settled in the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, thank you, God. I didn't know that was going to happen. When I sing on key, that's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> the Word of God in John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1 through 5 in the Amplified Version, says these words, John's Gospel chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. It says, In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. He was present originally with God, all things were made and came into existence through him, and without him was not even one thing made that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines on in the darkness, for the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out, or absorbed it, or appropriated it, and is unperceptive to it. I want to talk from the subject, beginnings, beginnings. How you start a thing is how you will end a thing. Beginnings are significant for so many reasons because if we get the beginning of something wrong, we'll get the end of it wrong. Um, how many of y'all have ever buttoned up a shirt or sweater and you ended up missing a button? Right? It became evident to hold the whole world that you had missed something, right? Well, you all, when we begin to understand the disciplines uh, that God would give to us as Christians, there are many different things that God will give to us. Uh, one thing is to understand, to, to seek and to knock and to ask of, of God and to, to expect from him uh, what he would do on the other side of that ask, to have an expectancy of, of seeking God. That's, that's a discipline, to lean into the expecting God to do what he would say to do. Another thing that God gives us as a spiritual discipline is an understanding of the importance of the word of God in the life of the believer. Now, you all, it would seem like this would be an obvious thing that, you know, as a Christian, we would all love the Bible and all love the Word of God. But George Barna, who is a uh, researcher that focuses a lot on Christian uh, kind of trends, and he, uh, this company is pretty much developed around that subject. Uh, in 2021, and when they did their study about uh, Americans and how many of them read the Bible on a daily basis, they said really about one out of six people on a consistent basis in 2021 read the Bible. Uh, so if you just look down your row, if there are about six people on your row, only about one of them are really reading the Bible on a regular basis, all right? So one in six people. Uh, and it's really frightening because for many of us, you all, we would assume that if, if the Bible says that God and his word are synonymous, that those of us that say, you know what, I want a closer relationship with God. I want a closer relationship with Jesus. And I believe that all of us do. You wouldn't be here, those that are online watching. You're not here because you don't want a relationship with God. Uh, but, but if we want a relationship with Jesus, and if we want a relationship with God, here's the question. Do we, what is our relationship with his word? Because the Bible says in John's gospel that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when we say, I want a relationship with God, it's kind of safe because uh, that's kind of far out and mystical. Uh, well, I, I, I want to I know God more. Well, how do you know God? Well, I don't really know. I just want to know him more, right? But, but if we know that the word of God and God are synonymous, right, then to know God more and to be in love with God more or to understand more about God means to know the word of God more and to be connected with the word of God more. And the enemy would have most of us to think that the Bible is, is boring and it's not relevant and it doesn't really make that much sense to be that extra with it. Uh, and I go to some churches recently and I'll be telling them I'm going to read 10 verses or 15 verses and I'll just be, oh God, here we go. And, and, you know, it's so sad because, uh, you know, you don't go to a restaurant and they're like, oh, we have food. Oh, food. <laughs> I mean, you expect to go to a restaurant and get food, right? And so you would assume that when you come to church, uh, you would get the word of God. But not every place. And that's why I love New Hope, because this is a ministry that is committed to the word of God, that you would understand it more and grow in that. Amen? 
And those of you that don't know about this and you're new on the journey, you're just investigating, we're just glad that you're tuning in. We're glad that you're here. And so there's no judgment if you don't know this. And that's the whole point. We want you to draw closer to God by drawing closer to his word. So John reveals something. He reveals to us the nature of God uh, by saying that in the beginning, God, which means that God predated the beginning. The beginning didn't start when God began because there is no beginning to God. From everlasting to everlasting, he's God. So when God started, he started start. (laughs) Uh, There there was no such thing as time until God said, let there be. And the moment that he began with those words, everything the Bible says, listen, everything that has been made, And everything that has been created has been created by the word of God. And it is being upheld by that word. Which means then everything that you and I have ever experienced in the tangible world, it came into existence by the intangible world. Every natural thing that you and I have or ever will experience has come into existence by the things that are unseen. Hebrews says it this way, that, that we know that the very worlds have been framed by the, world, the word of God. That the things that appear or the things that are seen have been made by those things that do not appear. So here's the question. For those of us that are trying to figure out more about God and how our life can be anchored in the truth of God's word, here's the truth. God wants you to realize, listen now, stop chasing after substance. Because substance is actually not substance. Siri, you know what? I come against her in the name of Jesus. When I ask Siri a question, she answers me not. Hmm. Hmm. Does she do that with you? Hmm. I'm working on that. And then she never figures it out. When I'm preaching the gospel, then she speaks. I come against you, Siri, in the name of Jesus. So here it is, you all. God says in the word that substance, which most of us are seeking, I need more money, I need more relationships, I need more things. We think that substance can come from substance. But Hebrews says, listen, listen, listen. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, which the things that we believe are substance are not really substance. Faith created Substance. So if you want more substance, stop running to substance for substance and run to faith, which produces substance. The word of God, the word of God is the the supernatural, intangible promises of God that God wants you and I to lean into to begin to live a life outside and above the boundaries of the natural. You and I are able to overcome things and we're able to experience things and we're able to to, to find great relief from things when we begin to trust God's word more than circumstances and more than situations. And some of us that are listening right now, you are being overwhelmed and overcome by what you see and not by what he said. Overcome by what you feel like you don't have and missing what you do have. And so God's word reveals to us the very nature of God himself and tells us some things about who he is and what we can expect about him. And one of the things it says, and I love this in in, in Psalms, when it explains the nature of God, Psalms 90 and 2 says this in the Amplified, before the mountains were brought forth or, or ever you had formed and given birth to the earth and to the world, even from everlasting to everlasting you are God. He says, before there were any mountains, before there was any earth, before there was a world, there was you. And if you and your word are synonymous, watch this now, before there were mountains, there was your word. Before there was a world, there was your word. Before there was any created thing, there was your word. And if then I want to put my trust in something or I want to anchor my faith to something, listen, I'm not going to anchor my faith to a mountain. I'm not going to anchor my faith to a world. I'm not going to anchor my faith or my life to a relationship, but I'm going to anchor my life to the word of God, which is greater and will outlast and outlive any created thing. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? 
So here's the question. If we know then that the nature of God is from everlasting to everlasting, that the word of God is from everlasting to everlasting, why do we put so much faith and confidence and expectation from people? We've made people equivalent to the word of God. You've made your doctor's report God's report. You've made the government's report God's report. You've made what you read in the newspaper, newspaper, that's so old. Uh, (laughs) I forget how old I am. You, You take what you're reading online and you assume that that is is the end all. And for many of us, we get discouraged and overwhelmed and upset about the condition of our lives and the condition of the world around us because we placed our faith in what we can see and our faith in what the world says and not what God says. If God's word says something, no matter what you see in the natural, no matter what is happening around you, you got to believe God's word above and beyond that. I don't know who I'm talking to. But I don't know what report you've been given. I don't know what the doctor has said about your condition. It doesn't mean it's not real. But I like Paul and what he said. Paul said, we look not at the things that are seen. It doesn't mean the things that are seen are not there. We just look not at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are not seen. Wait a minute, Paul. How can I look at things that are not seen if they're not seen? Because those of us that live a life of faith, we walk by faith and not by sight. Oh, my God. I don't know about you, but I believe that God is all powerful. I believe that God can do anything. I believe that God can heal cancer. I believe that God can bring unity in the body. I believe that God can bring down the division between the ethnicities that have plagued us forever. I believe that there can be a revival of the church. I I believe there's hope for your marriage. I believe you can lose some weight. I believe you can go back to college. I believe you can get a degree. I believe you can make a... Is there anybody here that believes that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask? If you don't believe it, then don't say anything. But is there anybody that believes that God is able? Then give him a praise for what you know he's able to do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When we understand the nature of God and we understand what the word of God claims about God, then we begin to place our faith and anchor ourselves onto something that is far more secure than your job, than your spouse, than your kids, than your friends, than your doctor, than your bank account. So God's nature is revealed to us as he shows us himself. But let me give you another scripture. It's not in the list, guys. I just added this. <laughs> Isaiah 55, 11. So shall, by my, my, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void without producing any effect or useless, but it shall accomplish that which I please and purpose, and it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it. God says, let me tell you something about my word. My word is able to do what it wants to do without you. That means I'm not counting on you for my word to work. He says, when I give a word, there's so much, because guess what? Because my word is me. So if my word is me, then when I give my word, you can count that that word is going to produce what it said it would produce, because God is not a man that he would lie, nor the son of man that he'd have to repent or apologize for what he said. Here's the question. What word has God given to you? And what enemy has made you think that the word of God is not true to you? The devil is a liar. If God said it, that settles it. If God says it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. Somebody said, if God says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, your belief ain't strong enough to undo it. God is not hung up 
on whether or not his word is contingent upon your belief. That means you can even be a doubter and get a hold of it. And it work. He says, uh, I wonder, can you believe that my word can change you? And if you believe that, you will have a different approach to the scriptures this year. This is the beginning of the year. Without making any empty promises about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, here's the thing. Wouldn't it be great to develop a discipline where the word of God becomes a regular part of your life? Listen, I can tell what you value by how much time you spend with it. You hear me? For some of you all, I can tell that you spent some time getting together because your hair is dead. <laughs> you know. <laughs> hey, you got your hair dead. I thank God every day for Mab Maybelline and Max, all them uh, different uh, makeup people. I thank God for them. I really do. I give praise to God every day for MAC Cosmetics. Because <laughs> some of us <laughs> need a little help on the journey. <laughs> right? Yeah, you do. And you take, yeah, you do. I'm not, I'm not throwing shade. I'm just being, I'm keeping it real. You need a little, little, little foundation, a little help. Because that's important to you. So you make time to get the right product and match the right shade and apply it the right way and go on TikTok to find out hacks to make the process easier because it's important to you. I can tell some of us enjoy food. <laughs> right? You don't have to tell me you like to eat. I can see. I like to eat, Harvey. I, I'm a prophet. I think you do. And listen, and by the way, if, if you're not laughing, what's wrong with you? That's why you have any friends. So here it is, you all. I can also tell how close you are to God by how much time you're spending in his word. No, no judgment. All of us are on a journey, right? And so all I'm asking is that if you desire for your life in 2023 to be different, maybe than years past, anchor your life and anchor your disciplines and anchor your behavior in making the word of God a regular part of your routine. You don't have to, you don't have to wonder, are you going to eat? You're going to eat. You don't have to wonder if you're going to get made up. You got, you, oh, gas. You're going to do those things because it's necessity for you. Here's the question. How necessary is the word of God to you? If you can ensure that every other box is checked, then make sure that that box is checked too. So not only does the word of God reveal to us the character and the nature of God, but it also reveals some things about what God would say that he promises to you. And it's just really one, one text I want to lift up here. It's a very familiar one in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. God says, I want you to get the word so that you can find encouragement in seasons of your life where you're discouraged. Have you ever been discouraged? I want you to find the word of God and apply it to your life so in those moments where you wonder whether or not your life has any genuine direction or any genuine purpose that you can go to the word of God and listen, find the truth in it minus the truth of your circumstance, which is really not the truth at all. And so Jeremiah 29 says these words from God to you, to us. This is what God says. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. You know what God says? I have plans for you. You are, I'm so grateful that God has ordered my steps in him. Even when I didn't know he was ordering my steps. Because when the Lord has plans for you, watch this now, your thoughts are not his thoughts. Thoughts. Your ways are not his ways. He says, as high as the heavens are from the earth are my thoughts and my ways from yours. So when God has plans for you, sometimes his plans will interrupt your plans. And how many of y'all have seen God shut down some things 
and you're wondering why has that relationship ended? Why did that job end? Why have I, every time I try to walk through this door, it seems like it's closed and it will not open. And you're wondering where is God in all of this? I mean, if God has plans for you, then guess what? What you might have thought was rejection was God saying, I've got to release that person from your life because where you're going, you cannot go with them connected. Are you hearing me? Some of y'all don't understand that maybe the things that you're suffering is not because God is against you, but the plans that he has for you are so specific that he's reorchestrating your life so that you can align with his purpose for you and not your own purpose for yourself. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of y'all are glad that God has not answered some of your prayers? <laughs> I heard a story once, Reese, that uh, this, this, this person was praying, uh, Lord, I need a Bentley. And they say, by the time it reached to heaven, it, it reached heaven, God, I need a bus pass. <laughs> they thought they needed a Bentley, but heaven said, you need a bus pass. Sometimes, you all, we will think that God is not hearing us or that God is ignoring us. But he says, listen, listen, the word of God, the word of God. I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. Your life is not in, in, in a free fall. Things are not happening by accident, but God is arranging and rearranging and, 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 and reordering and, and restructuring things so that his purposes and his, his, his will can prevail in your life. And you need to be open to God to say, you know what, God, even though this may not feel good, I trust you. Because sometimes you all, the process of getting to where we have to get doesn't always feel good. I remember when I went to the gym for the first time. And uh, I bought a little outfit, man. It was matching shoes. You know, everything was just matching. I was just, I was, man, I was ready, right? And I went there, and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the guy said, well, let me show you, show you the circuit. I said, I don't need the circuit. So I, I got this. So I said, take me straight to the weight bench. I don't want to go through the circuit. I want to get on the bench. He said, okay. He showed me where it was. And I got there. I'm telling you, it's a true story. And I got there, and I got on the bench. And I mean, I'm talking. Just, just I mean, just clearing it. I felt the tap on the side. I said, excuse me, man, I'm working out. Don't bother me. He said, just, just one minute. I said, okay, okay, what is it? He said, you know, you're supposed to put, like, weight on the, on the bar. <laughs> True story. <laughs> I'm just going. I'm like, I'm having fun. He said, yeah, you have to add, like, weight. That's the whole point of, like, this. Is... <laughs> and I didn't like the pain of the weight, wow. but the pain of the weight had a purpose so on the other side of it. And sometimes we don't like the pain of the process. But the pain of the process is giving us strength that we would not have if we didn't go through the process. What is God saying to you? The plans I have for you, some of them may take you through some additional weight. Some things you're lifting that you don't want to lift. Some things you're having to deal with that you don't think you want to deal with, but he's preparing you. And for some of you all, you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the keychain. And if you can make it through the hell you went through last year, you can make it through the, 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 the challenges of this year. And for some of us, we wonder why the pain has been so intense. It's maybe because God says, I've got plans for you, and some of my plans will take you through some pretty tough places. So not only that, but the text also says this, and I'm almost done, believe it or not. It says, uh, well, not quite, but. <laughs> uh, his thoughts and plans are for peace, for, for, good, for good prosperity. It says welfare for, for prosperity and for peace and not for evil, which means then when evil happens, it's not because God planned it. If he did, he's a liar because he said the plans I have for you are not for evil. Well, wait a minute, God. Evil has happened to me. So what does that mean, that you allowed evil to happen to me? I thought you said your plans were to give me prosperity and peace and not evil. Right. So where is this evil coming from? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Come here, Job. Job was a man that loved God. And he, he, he tried to stay away from anything that was not honoring to God. He was not perfect. He was not sinless like Jesus, but he was a godly man, a, a righteous man. And you know what happened? Uh, the devil was uh, walking around the earth trying to find out who, who he could destroy. Went up to heaven in the presence of God, and God says, where have you been? He said, oh, I'm just walking to and fro, 
I'm all in Durham and Raleigh, just trying to find who I can destroy. You know what God said? Hmm, have you considered Job? The devil didn't even know who Job was. God introduced the devil to Job. Not because God wanted to hurt Job, but God wanted to show the devil, let me show you what a child who loves me looks like. Let me show you that no matter what you do, he said, as a matter of fact, you can do anything you want, but don't touch his soul. You can touch his family. You can touch his money. You can touch his health. You can touch his relationships, but do not touch his soul. Because one thing I know about Job, even though he goes through all kinds of tragedy and all kinds of betrayal and all kinds of illness and all kinds of loss, I know one thing at the end of it, he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And so here's the question. What is God, watch this now, what is God giving you in the way of trouble that's not not him punishing you, but him showing you off. What would happen if you would look at your adversity, not as God being evil against you, but showing the devil, let me show you what somebody who loves me will do when you throw all hell at them. They still in church today. They, don't, they lost their job, but they're still in worship. They're in the middle of a divorce, but they're still in worship. They're struggling with their health, but they're still in worship. They're dealing with all kind of calamity, but their face doesn't look like it. There's some people that are in the house right now that are going through difficulties, but you still have a praise on your Lips, is there anybody here that says, even though I might be going through it, God is still worthy of the glory and the honor and the praise? Is there anybody? Oh, yeah. The Word of God reveals to us that God is not to harm you, but to actually allow His grace to show up even when suffering exists. Finally, you all, he says in the end of this, and I love this because this is kind of the name of your church. He says, my plans are to give you hope because I can't trust you to find it. I can't trust you to even know where to locate hope. So when you are at your lowest point, Knowing the plans I have for you, I'm going to give you hope and an expected end. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would get a hold of the word of God. So that when all kind of calamity happens in your life, you will call to remembrance. Wait a minute. I know I'm going through stuff, but what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says God has a plan for my life. The Word of God says God is to help me and not to harm me. The Word of God says he's going to give me hope. I don't feel hopeful, but he promised that he would, and I haven't expected it. That means you have faith even in the circumstance when it doesn't call for faith because you know what the Word of God says. You all, I stand on the Word for everything. You better hear me. You can't stand on what you don't know. I was in California. I did not know that there was a jaywalking thing. <laughs> and please forgive me, I'm a man of God. But I got pulled over by the cop as I was walking <laughs> across the street. And he got ready to issue me a ticket. And he asked me for my driver's license. <laughs> Me being the man of God that I am, I said, oh, you mean my walking license? <laughs> I got the ticket. <laughs> he probably won't give me a warning until I got smart alecky about it, but here's the, this is what he said to me. Watch this now, because it's your ignorance of California law does not exonerate you from California law. Your ignorance of the word of God does not exonerate you from the effects and the promises of it. If you are unaware of it, you are not experiencing all of the blessings that God wants to give you. And just because you don't know it doesn't mean that those things are not in operation. I encourage you to get a relationship with the word of God. Finally, there's one more thing that the word of God reveals, and this is my favorite part. It tells me what I can do what I can do uh, as I trust him. And, and you all know uh, this story. It's in uh, Matthew's gospel, Matthew 14. Uh, Jesus is now telling his disciples to get into a boat and uh, 
uh, I'll go on the other side. I'll meet you a little bit later. I did, I did spend some more time in prayer. So the disciples go into the boat, and they're, they're rowing. And a storm comes. I mean, really, really bad storm. They're crying out to God, God, save us. God, help us. And as they're crying out in prayer, Jesus comes walking on the water. Remember that? And they say, immediately they say, oh, it's a ghost. Isn't that funny? When you call to God for an answer and he shows up in a way that you don't expect, you ascribe it to something else other than him. It's a ghost. Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's not a ghost. It's me. <laughs> and the self-appointed spokesman for the apostles, Peter, he says, if it is you, give me a word. Because I've watched you work with words. And I've seen what happens when you give a word. When you said, Lazarus, come forth. Even though Lazarus was dead. And the Bible says he was stinking dead. The Bible says that he came forth even though he was bound like a mummy. He came forth out of the grave. Wasn't unbound yet. So the power of God's word come forth. As a matter of fact, somebody said, had he not said Lazarus, every dead man in the cemetery would have got up because the word of God is that powerful. Lazarus, come forth. I know what your word can do. And so he says, bid me come. Jesus doesn't give a whole Bible uh, chapter. He doesn't give a book of the Bible. He just says one word, come. And listen, for some of you all, you don't need a whole lot of words. You just need one word. If God be for you, who can be against you? If you get a word in your spirit, then you can face any circumstance in any situation. God is able to supply all of my need according to his riches and glory in and through Christ Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Uh, listen, I'm perplexed on every side, but I'm not messed up. Listen, if you find a word, you can apply it to every situation. He said, give me a word. And Jesus said, come. And Peter left the boat and stepped out on something that was impossible. He started walking on an impossibility by the word of God. You better hear me now. God is asking you to start living a life of the impossible. Not in your own strength and your own ability, but by and through the power of his word. And the Bible says he's walking on water. And you know the story. The waves and the winds were blowing and he saw those. The Bible says he started to sink. In my early years of preaching, you all, I'm, I'm black. I don't know if y'all know that. I'm black. <laughs> and I'm Baptist in the back. So I'm, I'm Baptist. I'm kind of Baptist and I was a little Pentecostal. I'm kind of like a Baptocostal. Uh, <laughs> Pentabaptist. <laughs> uh, and so... I remember in my early years of preaching that when I would talk about that text, I, I, I used it in, in an improper way. And you've heard this before. As, as Peter was walking on the water, I would say, mm. and as he looked at the winds and the waves, he began to sink. He took his eyes off of Jesus. Whatever you do, don't take no eyes off of Jesus. And folk, Woo! you know it. Wrong. <laughs> Peter was not walking on the water because he was looking at Jesus. Because the waves were already blocking Jesus the whole time. He was walking on the word that Jesus gave him. The word said, come, so he came. What caused him to sink was not what he saw, but doubting what he heard. I don't know if the word is able to sustain me with these winds and these waves. So he started to sink. But Jesus in his mercy grabbed him by the hand and picked him up and they both walked back. I think they moonwalked <laughs> back to the boat. Here's the last point. What is the word of God telling you? What is the word of God saying to you? For some of you, the word of God is calling you to accept him. That's the word. Come to Jesus. Oh, but I'm a drinker. Or I'm a smoker. Oh, so are some other people here. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No piece of dirt can judge another piece of dirt. Just because a dirt has a Bible in his hand doesn't mean that they're not dirt. But one, one piece of dirt has Jesus. And we're just inviting you, if that's the word, for you to come, to come 
to Jesus. Others of you that already know Jesus, now God is calling you to, to deeper commitments with him. Maybe to trust him in a way that you've never trusted. Maybe to overcome your depression by looking at your circumstances and not looking at what his word says. Maybe he's calling you to live a life of faith above a life of fear and doubt and unbelief. For others of you, he's calling you into service in deeper and more meaningful ways. Wouldn't it be awesome this year at New Hope that those of you that God is calling to serve him in some significant ways, listen, would put yourself out of the equation and what you can't do. And this is what I'm struggling with. And pastor, I still am on my journey and I don't think I can be used on my journey. Please, if that is the reason why we could not serve God, none of us would be serving God. We're all on a doggone journey. So bring your broken self and serve at the door broken. Because I promise you, it'll mean more to somebody to meet another broken brother or sister at the door than somebody that's not going through. Imagine the gifts in the marketplace that you have, bringing them to the kingdom. And so, New Hope, as I end this message, as we anchor ourselves this year and figure out how to follow the way, let the Word of God be the guide that leads you along the path. Let the word of God be the thing that anchors you when everything else causes you to be all over the place. Let the word of God remind you that God is for you. And if God is for you, nobody can be against you. Let the word of God remind you that greater is God in you than the enemy that is in the world. Let the word of God remind you that the Lord is your shepherd. You ain't got a lack for nothing. Are you hearing me? When your mother and father forsake you, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Lo, he'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Let the word of God be your anchor. Is there anybody ready to see a blessed year? Then give God praise. Give God praise. Give God praise. Give God praise, God praise for his eternal word.